Okay, so what is the cell membrane? Well, imagine this here is a cell and the membrane is the thing that goes around the outside of it. But I think we want to find out a bit more. What's it made of? What's its job? Why does it do we need a cell membrane? Well, let's check it out. So let's start by looking at this key idea. All cells have a cell membrane made of phospholipids and proteins. That is all cells. Animal, plant, the eukaryotic cells, and prokaryotic cells as well. But the cell membrane is not to be confused with the cell wall. That is often a common mistake that people make, is they get those two things mixed up. All cells have a cell membrane, not all cells have a cell wall. For example, animal cells we know do not have a cell wall. Cells that have a cell wall are cells like plant cells, fungi and some bacterial cells. So only some have that cell wall while every cell has a cell membrane. If the cell has a cell wall, it's on the outside of the cell membrane and the cell membrane sits within that. So let's start by looking at the structure. When we're looking at the structure, we're asking questions like, well, what's it look like and what is it made of? So the first structural feature is that the cell membrane is very, very thin, about eight nanometers thick. To give you some perspective on that, this piece of paper is about 100,000 nanometers thick. So that gives you some idea about how thin we're talking for this cell membrane. Now, remember phospholipids. Let's bring this back in to remind you. This is a phospholipid made of two fatty acids, a glycerol head along with a phosphate group and an ethanolamine group. We call this a phospholipid. The symbol that we use to represent it is this symbol here phosphate head and the two fatty acid tails. Not to be confused with a lipid which actually has three fatty acids. If you want to revise that, check out the lipids video. So the phospholipid, let's remind ourselves that the tail end is what we call hydrophobic. It hates water, it repels water. But the head, the phosphate head is hydrophilic. It attracts water. And it's that very feature that, may, that makes the phospholipid so great to form the cell membrane. What happens with the cell membrane, if I take this away, is it forms a bilayer of phospholipids. So two layers of phospholipids, and they take on this sort of structure. The fatty acid tails face inwards, and the phosphate heads face outwards because outside of the cell and inside of the cell is going to be lots of water. But within the cell membrane, it can stay away from the water. So that's why it takes on that bilipid layer. So remember, this is just a section of the cell membrane that we're looking at. The cell membrane would be going all the way around our cell. And the other thing is that embedded within the membrane are protein molecules. Here's one protein molecule. And if we keep bringing this away, you can see another protein molecule. And so that gives you an idea of what the cell membrane is made up of. A bilayer of phospholipids and protein molecules embedded throughout. Now the proteins are there for an important reason. Some of them have carbohydrates attached to them, not all of them, but some. And the proteins act as channel proteins to allow things to move in and out of the cell, or receptor proteins to help the cells recognize other chemical messages or other cells themselves. So they play a really pivotal role. And because of the way that the cell membrane looks with all of those phosphate heads and those proteins embedded throughout, we describe the membrane using the fluid mosaic model. So let's break down that term and understand what we mean by that. First of all, let's focus on this term mosaic. The term mosaic commonly refers to a picture made out of many, many smaller pieces. The smaller pieces are commonly 
stones or tiles or pieces of glass. You can see an example of this guy making a mosaic picture here. Another one which I just had to share with you is this mosaic of one of my favourite Nintendo games ever created, Super Mario 3. Uh, but anyway, getting sidetracked, mosaics are pictures made of lots of smaller pieces. And the cell membrane looks exactly like that. Maybe not that well in this diagram that I've got here, but if we bring in another one, you can see that the cell membrane has got, so this is a larger portion of cell membrane, We've still got the phospholipids, which you can see here. Here are the proteins embedded throughout. Here's some carbohydrate that we talked about on some of them. But if we were to look top down and have a look at this from above, you would see lots and lots and lots of phospholipid heads and then every now and then a protein embedded. It takes on the appearance of a mosaic. The reason that we say it's the fluid mosaic is because the cell membrane is dynamic. It is able to move and change. It has a characteristic where like when you push two bubbles together, what happens when you push two bubbles together? Yeah, they burst sometimes, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they join together and form one. And also sometimes you can separate a bubble into two smaller bubbles. Bubbles are dynamic. The cell membrane is dynamic as well. And so we call this the fluid mosaic model. Fluid because it's dynamic, mosaic because of its appearance. Cool, I think we've learned a bit about the structure of the cell membrane. What about taking a look at the function? When we're talking about the function, we're now looking at what is its job? What does it do? The cell membrane does a few important things. First and foremost, the cell membrane provides a boundary. Because of the cell membrane, we know where the cell starts and finishes. It has a way of differentiating where the cell is and where the cell is not. If we didn't have a boundary around the outside of the cell, there would be no cell. So that's an important function. Secondly, the cell membrane regulates the passage of materials into and out of the cell. The cell membrane is responsible for controlling this. You shall not pass! Weird. So the cell membrane plays a role in deciding what's going to enter the cell and what's going to exit the cell, which is really, really important. We'll get back to that in a minute. But that's where the proteins play a role. The proteins, as we saw, can be involved in helping things move in and out of the cell and recognising what should be moving into and out of the cell and what shouldn't be moving into and out of the cell. The other thing the cell membrane is responsible for and where those proteins play a role is in recognition. Other cells and hormones are examples of things those receptors would be there to detect. Lastly, the cell membrane is attached to the cytoskeleton only in eukaryotic cells because only eukaryotic cells have a cytoskeleton. Here's two different examples of some eukaryotic cells some blood cells and a nerve cell. You can see they look very different from each other. A nerve cell has a big long thin shape, a red blood cell is a bioconcave disc and a white blood cell is different again. The cytoskeleton plays a critical role in maintaining those different structures and the cell membrane is attached to the cytoskeleton. So finally, why is it so important that the cell controls what comes in and out. You shall not pass! Got to stop bringing that in. It's important for this reason. The intracellular environment of cells differs in composition from their extracellular environment. What that means really simply is that outside of the cell is very different to inside of the cell. And that is intentional. Let me show you an example. These are the concentrations of some ions inside and outside of a human muscle cell. 
And you can see these are the ions here, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, chloride. The concentrations are very different inside of the cell than they are outside of the cell. And you might be thinking, yeah, okay, so what, does it matter? Yes, it does matter. For the processes inside of a cell to occur correctly, it's very important that they maintain concentrations within a very specific range. This exact range here of these, of these substances inside of the cell. If, for example, the concentration of sodium ions was to change from 5 to 15 and take in some sodium from outside of the cell, which we can see there's lots of it, that would change the environment inside of the cell and it would mean that cellular processes would not occur correctly and the cell would be in big trouble. So we absolutely have to maintain specific concentrations inside of the cell. That is where diffusion, osmosis, active transport, endocytosis and exocytosis are all involved. They're the processes by which the cell maintains its internal environment. If you want to find out more about those though, you have to check out some other videos. So that's been the cell membrane and why it's important. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you next time. In all of my videos, I use information and material from the Biology Levels of Life textbook, workbook and teaching notes. If you want any information on how to get hold of these, just leave a comment below or email me on jeremy.s.lacornu at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe if you want regular updates on my new videos. And as always, thanks so much for your support and positive feedback. I'm really glad that my videos are helping you.